So, at the end of April this year, I was honoured to be invited to Wolfson College in Oxford to document a series of informal presentations and conversations concerning the role of probability in physics. This so-called unconference was sponsored by the Utopia Foundation. Perhaps the most polarising issue to emerge over the course of the discussions was the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which seemed to pitch some of the more practically minded experimental physicists like Marcus Arndt from the University of Vienna against those big picture theoretical physicists like David Deutsch from Oxford, who were more willing to embrace this grand view of ever branching parallel universes. So for the sake of this video, I asked Marcus and David if they wouldn't mind hashing out their differences over their lunch break in one of the corridors at Wolfson. And I began by asking Marcus how he conceived of the tensions here. The fundamental problem that we all try to solve is uh, why is there this unitary evolution of quantum mechanics, which seems to explain everything very naturally, and out of a sudden, during a measurement, this, this evolution has to be reduced, collapsed in, uh, in the Copenhagen interpretation, and that's, I think, something that David doesn't like. He wants to have everything in the same, mm. um, same mathematical formalism. But if you follow it through, it leads to realities which seem to multiply. And then my question yes. to you is, what is really the meaning of reality to you? Because, um, well, I experience only my single reality here. Yes. You, you put it in terms of how do we make sense of uh, the unitary evolution compared with what we see at a measurement and so on. I, I would want to start before that. I, I think we, we, we want to understand the world. We want to understand how the world is. And uh, that, that is not necessarily what we perceive. Our, our, our perceptions are at the end of a long chain of, of uh, physical processes of which themselves we only have scientific uh, knowledge or indirect knowledge. So I would start with the question, how do we explain quantum phenomena like interference? Uh, not how do we make sense of quantum theory, which gives the right predictions, but first, before that, how do we explain quantum phenomena? So there's, there's an interference process and we have an uh, interference pattern which we can see without uh, any um, quantum mechanics that the, the result of the experiment cannot be explained by the events that we see. Now, this is not very unusual. This happens a lot you know, in physics and ultimately every observation is made very indirectly. So we have to infer things that, that are not there. Although it, infer is, is the wrong word. We have to uh, conjecture explanations. So uh, that's where I would start. But um, what makes you then certain that um, there must be a parallel world in that sense, or many, infinitely many parallel worlds, <clears throat> instead of either some hidden variables? Although, yes. of course, as an experimentalist, I know that some kinds of hidden variables uh, have certainly been ruled out. And do we need the notion of reality more than the notion of information? Is, is so to say, the the many worlds thing an information world or a reality world in a thingy sense? Yes, so I, uh, that's a very interesting point about the relationship of information to reality because many people think that the concept of information is somehow prior to physics, that the laws of information are like mathematical theorems, they, they must be so. Um, whereas I tend to the view that, that what information does and what it can do in the world is determined by physics. And therefore, uh, in, re in regard to physics, physics is a theory of the world, of, of the re reality of the world, not about the information. There is this view that, that quantum mechanics only tells us what we will see, and it's silent about everything else. Everything else is, is just uh, mathematical formalism. But I think that that ultimately leads to solipsism and it is no good philosophically. But it's even more important maybe for a physicist, it's no good for finding out what the next theory will be. If, if, you, if you just think a theory is, is, is uh, the predictions of experiments, then we would never have got from Kepler's theory to Newton's theory and from Newton's theory to Einstein's because they differ from each other in what in, in predictive terms is a tiny amount but in explanatory terms, it's an enormous amount, changes our whole view of the universe. But, but in terms of predictions, uh, coming back to the many worlds yes. and the predictive power of the many worlds, 
Um, <clears throat> I'm sitting here, I can only probe my local world. Uh, even within my local world, I, I seem to experience all these funny quantum superpositions where you would probably say another part of the multiverse is branching into me again or into my world again. Yes. But, but this, this process is kind of experimentally, at least at the moment, very difficult to access. And the question is, do you have a good proposal how to do it? Yes, so uh, I mentioned interference experiments. So interference in an interference experiment, we don't, it, even with this notion of uh, seeing things by, through the explanation, we only see that the, let's say, the photon exists in two instances rather than rather than that the whole world does and uh, when you talk about your experience at the moment as you say we can only probe whether uh, an experimental outcome is caused by a single history or by multiple histories of an atom a molecule I mean you you in, in your talks you, you gave wonderful example of very large objects uh, from a, from an atomic point of view, um, exhibiting interference of existing in more than one instance. Uh, when we have quantum computers, uh, we will be able to have very large, very complex entities existing in superpositions. So in principle, I suggested a long ago, before this was uh, remotely uh, on the cards experimentally, that if we had a quantum computer on which an artificial intelligence program was running, say, with human-level artificial intelligence, then this entity would be able to experience interference in its own uh, consciousness. Well, some people would say that um, your consciousness would collapse your reality into yes. a certain point. So if that happened, that would yeah. refute yeah. Uh, the average interpretation, that, uh, or, or as I would say, it would refute quantum theory. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that, that would be a, a very interesting problem. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why scaling up both the size and the complexity and the mass of phenomena that are experimentally observed but can only be explained by quantum theory is very important. That yeah. I fully agree, <laughs> because we need to do that. Um, and, yeah. and we just need to close the gap between that and the AI, because the AI would not be having this conversation, or at least the AI would not be able to make the argument that you just made. Uh, it, it, it would have to say, I've only got evidence of many worlds on the scale of my mind, mm -hmm. but not bigger. So, and I guess that will always be true. Yeah, but th th there's something in, in, the, in the formulation or phrasing of our sentences where, where I'm getting also doubtful. At least when I talk about these things, about superpositions, I always make uh, these quote-unquote uh, when I say a particle is uh, at the same time here and there, um, because there are two words that I don't understand, three words that I don't understand. Uh, first, the word is, so reality. Yeah. The second, what does time really mean? And the third one, what does space really mean? And we don't have any experimental evidence that the particle is at the same time here and there. We just have a physical description, the quantum mechanical description that the wave function behaves as if. And how can I we make the step to the many worlds then? I think we have something slightly more than that. Again, you come from the theory. Mm -hmm. from the, the, we are, but, but I think prior to the theory, we have the experience that this thing cannot be explained by mm -hmm. single trajectories. Definitely. Uh, somebody, yeah. who, you know, we don't have to believe quantum mechanics to, mm -hmm. to, to see that. Mm -hmm. So we, we rule out single trajectory uh, explanations. Uh, the, 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 and that we have before we have quantum mechanics. If we didn't have quantum mechanics, it would be a mystery. Mm -hmm. We would mm -hmm. say there simply mm -hmm. is no explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, hypothetically, could this maybe be explained um, by some very weird folding of space-time in this case? So not really making another multiverse or yes. another branch of the multiverse, but really a, a new 3D or 4D space-time or another 11-dimensional uh, yes. space-time. No. Could that jump through, a shortcut through another higher dimension, so to say, from one end to the other? Uh, yes, is the answer. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, uh, calling the multiverse many universes is a bit of a misnomer, mm -hmm. because the whole point of it is interference. Mm -hmm. And but, uh, many universes, parallel universes, would indicate separate universes, mm -hmm. and that these, or that these universes, that our universe splits into two every time a quantum event happens. Whereas actually it's only the it's only the electron mm -hmm. or the photon or something that's splitting. Now, if this can be explained in another way than by quantum theory, then another thing we know from just 
you know, without theory, with, with just uh, elementary reasoning about the experiments, is that this other thing has to be immensely complicated. It's sort of two to the power of the complexity of what we see. And again, when we have fully-fledged quantum computers, we will have computations going on whose results can, cannot be explained by any history of the computer that has it mm -hmm. single-valued. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when that number is greater than the number of atoms in the universe, mm -hmm. which will easily be attained as soon as we have quantum computers... So yes, there could be another explanation in terms of folded universes or other dimensions or, or what, but those things would have to be as complicated mm -hmm. as the many universes. And as um, some people were saying at the other Everett conference, these things would contain other, they, they would contain other instances of people or they would, they, or they would contain things whose shapes were mm -hmm. the, uh, other instances of people and so on and other instances of the quantum computer mm -hmm. which would be interacting with our mm -hmm. instance and so on. So uh, it's really a matter of terminology then whether you, whether you call that a multiverse or mm -hmm. parallel mm -hmm. universes or a, a much higher dimensional reality than in classical concepts. Um, and in, in your multiverse concept, um, well, there are, again, zillions of branches, and hypothetically, you could also be, be, be here, and in this other part of the branch of the multiverse, uh, you, you could be uh, in a different, different place, different time, different internal state. Yeah. What, what does that tell us about your identity? Does that affect anything about how you feel as a human, so to say? Um, it, it, it certainly has to be taken into account, but it's... Logically, it's the same issue as am I the same person that I was 10 years ago mm -hmm. or that I will be mm -hmm. in 10 years' time? I mean, if we go back to, to when I was a baby, I, I certainly was not the same person as I am today. There is a continuity between uh, me then and me now, but that doesn't mean I'm the same person because a qua person, I have changed uh, drastically. And so, but... The relationship between the past and the present is one kind of thing. The relationship between the present and future is a different kind of thing. The relationship between uh, one branch, Everett branch, and another mm -hmm. is a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in all cases, what, what makes us say that those things are real is the explanations that we have for here and now. Although other scientists would say, uh, shut up and measure, or yes. calculate actually. Yes. <laughs> Um, just uh, don't talk about things that you cannot see and uh, the, the other part of the, the other branches you don't see so why do you dare not to shut up? <laughs> yes, well uh, first of all I think that th that, that, um, that attitude involves saying that there are certain questions about reality that you're not allowed to ask. You're, you're, you're allowed to ask how the experiment was prepared, you're allowed to ask what will the results be, you're, you're not allowed to ask how were the results brought about mm -hmm. By the preparation, mm -hmm. so that's what. So therefore, it's not an explanation mm -hmm. in, in my terms. But uh, and, and as for shut up, um, that's really uh, another way of of trying to evade the, the consequences in terms of reality. Like like my favorite example is of of dinosaurs mm -hmm. in the past. So there are people who say nobody ever saw a dinosaur, nobody ever will, and therefore. It's just a frivolity to say that they really exist. At most, we can say fossils behave as though dinosaurs existed. But no paleontologist would accept talking that way, even though there is no experimental way of disproving that, that manner of speaking. So, and that's because paleontologists are only interested in paleontology because they want to know what really happened. Not, they, they're not... You know, if they were if they were interested in fossils, they would be geologists. 